so our final takeaway is going to be presented by an industry leader, a visionary, not just in technology, but in experience, guest experience, travel. Uh, he has spent many years in the hospitality industry and was one of the visionary founders of Citizen M Hotels right here in Amsterdam. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. Michael Levy. Thanks. I'm, I'm always afraid that if they say experience, that means old. But um, So I'm sure you've heard a lot about technology today, about opportunities, about depth of what is coming and how to apply that in your organizations or for your organization to apply into the industry. Um, often when we talk about innovation, uh, a lot of people uh, get extremely excited. And um, when we had first started out uh, uh, our company, uh, I was asked to speak at a European conference on innovation. And uh, before me was a, a little, very bright Korean man, Chan Kim. And he, together with Raymond A. Moborn, uh, wrote Blue Ocean and the whole theory of Blue Ocean. And uh, it was an innovation conference, 1,200 people in the room, and Chan Kim climbed up on stage and said, who likes innovation? And 1,200 hands go up. And he yelled at them, you're stupid. And that's how he started the day. Not necessarily people running after innovation, but I think what he tried to say to them is that innovation, in its first year of rollout, has a very slim chance of survival. So actually, it is 83% of innovation strands in the first year. The idea, no financing, no ability to roll out, whatever obstacles they run into. So there's only a very small part that actually makes it to the other side. And that is once we have innovated and found. And the question often is, how do I get to innovate? How do I get up in the morning and see if I can do something different uh, than what we have done in the past? So over the next half hour or so, I want to take you a little bit into the world of the hospitality industry and where we as an industry have been stuck into and show a little bit what we try to do in innovating and some method or methodology behind it, how to get there. So, um, This is a um, very proud innovation because each of these companies represented here by Bedroom will tell their customers that they have the coolest bed, the best place to stay, that their brand is very, very, very differentiated from the others. We look at it and we go like, really? And as long as we as an industry can take a logo and a name down one day and put a logo and a name up that same day of a different company, not change anything in the organizations and continue running, then the differentiation factor and what it is that we try to do is very difficult. So innovation is something that we really need to come across with in order to start building a brand or to have loyalty or to have people uh, distinguish us from others. Now, there are some companies that have taken that extreme. The upper left is a, a picture of the Burj Al Arab and, uh, you know, uh, incredible, uh, you know, experience or an ice hotel or an airplane hotel or an underwater hotel, you name it. That is maybe a little extreme. But anywhere in between would be nice that if you want to come across as having a differentiated product or being able to attract people to you because you have innovated, there is a way that you need to uh, be able to convey that. Now, in order to uh, show you how difficult it is to come out of a red ocean, and the red ocean uh, by uh, Chan Kim and Rene Moborn in Blue Ocean is uh, described as, we're all trying to do the same, but we think we do something very special. So this is a picture of a big lake in, the, in Minnesota where 30,000 holes are drilled and everybody fishes for the championship. And I guarantee you that every 30,000 fishermen that go there tell themselves, I am the best fisherman. I hook my bait differently. I, you know, float my bait at a different level. I 
hook my fish differently. I mean, they got all kinds of theories where they're so good, right? But, you know, it's a crapshoot. Who of this 30,000 just happened to have a few more fish swim by, right? So there is a huge red ocean of competition, and we actually might improve, you know, our fishing rod or the wire or, or little things, but how do we really move fishing to another extreme? Well, let me show you another extreme, and this is a blue ocean not comparable with that fishing lake, but this is whereby um, there is a fish farm where actually in the ocean, in natural habitat, fish are born and grown in captivity. So there we go to full other extreme. And it's just more to not compare but illustrate that if we go into innovation and see how we can move things along, we have the ability as human beings to come up with a lot of good ideas. And technology uh, obviously needs to enable us. I think that Nick started out very uh, you know, appropriate by saying and eloquent that if we notice it's technology, we have failed already. But if the technology enables us, incredible, right? So also here with innovation, if we do not get the innovation to a point where, where the consumer accepts it and the uh, consumer uh, sees us differently or differentiated because of that, we don't get there. So let's take a look at our industry. Intense competition, uh, incremental improvements. Uh, we have very distinct segments. Today, we have a very sim similar competitive strategy and, and, and advantage or disadvantage. We, we all sort of fight at the same level. And the digital and tech opportunities are huge. So we have a complex industry where we really can make the difference. So this picture will say to some something and to others, no. Well, on the, one, uh, on the left hand side, you see the good night chocolate. So our industry, I mean, when we, when we innovate, we innovate good, right? So uh, somebody introduces a, a good night chocolate, and the next one says, I made mine mint, and the third one says, I, I embossed my logo into it, and the fourth one, you know, has, again, slight deviation, but everybody all of a sudden thinks that to have a good night chocolate on your pillow is what we need to do. We all brush our teeth, show up at the bed, and go like, crap, right? What now? Do I eat the chocolate, rebrush my, or what do I do, right? So it, it really doesn't help us that much. On the right-hand side is um, uh, middleware um, that we are using to be able to know through what Nick mentioned already before, a room controller, and we have smart access to our room so we know what works and what doesn't work. So we felt that let's go skimpy on the chocolate, but let's really go uh, high on the technology so that we are able to change the guest expectation. So if there's a high expectation and you deliver every day, heck of a lot better than if you have to bribe them with chocolates. So the real question is, how can you make from a no, from, from an obstruction of trying to move ahead and get something new, how can you sort of morph that into a yes? How can I get into innovation and how do I get my mind there? For that, I want to take you to a very principle and basic uh, uh, philosophy or, or a line of thinking. So a little stool we all know and sit on sometimes, and these stools have three legs, right? So if it has three legs, we can sit on it, although it's small and maybe a little woody after a while, but still we can sit on it. But most of the time, we only, in our industries or in development or innovation, use two of the three legs. So the one leg that we use is content. We're very good at deciding what it is that we want to do. The second, we spend a lot of time on process. And then when we focus hard enough on content and process, we think we eventually will get there and get to something new and shift that pendulum to get innovation adapted and to be able to move forward. Any idea who, what is the third leg? So the, fir, the third leg is context. In which context are we developing something new? In which context are we introducing content and process? So Nick's presentation of, uh, of, of, of better and more effective use of key, 
with NFC? Well, in which context do we do that? So that is in the context of payment, door entry, ease of use, guest facilitating the process and, and making intuitive decisions. So in that context, all of a sudden we understand the content and the process much better. And often innovation sits idle or broken out of context. So we're focusing on what it is that we offer. We also know maybe what the process is that it, that it achieves, but we do not understand how is it adapted into an industry? H how does it sit with the, the consumer? And is there really a guest need? And is there uh, an ability to differentiate ourselves later if we have done that innovation? So context is very decisive. And I want to do a little quick exercise with you on context. So car, train, boat, plane, what do you think of? Transportation, okay. So if we think of transportation, then let's see how our brain connects up transportation. So our brain sees a little rental car, the commuter train in the morning, going into work with the ferry, getting on the 7 a.m. flight and flying home at nine at night. So we, with transportation, immediately have an association and our brain tells us what we do. So how do I shift and how do I use context differently or how do I get to innovate? You first need to shift your thinking to new thinking. And you do that by taking again those same words, car, train, boat, and plane. But let's say instead of transportation, we're talking about leisure. So now my brain also gets that. So the rental car gets to be an open sport car, maybe a little yellow horse on the front, romantic train ride. The boat looks a heck of a lot better than that, um, than that ferry. And maybe the plane takes me to a very uh, in incredible safari. So same four words, context, can be completely shifted if we put a different context on it. And what happens with us, and that is a very similarity that we as human beings have with technology, we wake up every morning in default. So how many of you, before going to sleep, look at your watch and wake up in the morning and look at your watch again, and by calculating how many hours you slept, you decide whether you're tired or not? <laughs> yeah, but you laugh, but we do that, right? So that's sort of a default. So instead of waking up and go like, how do I feel? Oh, I feel awesome. Maybe I slept an hour, maybe less. So in order to shift your context, in order to shift to innovating, in order to shift to something new, you gotta and understand that you're in a default setting and understand that that comes because of context and you first need to shift context. So new context for the hospitality. What we said, okay, there are defined categories, the luxury hotel category, and there's the mid-market hotel category. And we arbitrarily said we're in between. Why? Because we said so. So first of all, you need to also set new context. And with that new context comes then the new thinking. So we said being everything to everyone, you're nothing to anyone. So we as hoteliers try to please absolutely everybody midweek a conference, corporate travel, and then on the weekend we need to be a romantic hideout or be able to host parties or weddings or whatever. It's very difficult with a room. So this room today needs to be a business setting and on Saturday I'm sure there will be a big wedding going on. But it's very difficult to do that in the setting. So what we said from a hotel point of view, we do not want to cater to everybody. So we're going to cater in between that luxury and that mid-market, and we're going to do it for the frequent traveler. And a frequent traveler that is always on the road has certain ways that they go through life. And that's what we call a lifestyle hotel. So we emulate what they do in their lifestyle, and we took a little niche, and that's what we represented. So then we looked at how do those people look, and we envisioned what it is that these people look like. So they are from businessmen to to innovators, to creatives, to all kinds of people that travel frequently, and they're not necessarily very happy with the level of orange used in most hotels, right? It's a little boring. The second thing that you need to understand is that people look for a low price, but they also look for luxury. So how do you merge those two? So we want a five-star product, but we really can only pay a mid-market price. So 
in order to shift that traditional thinking and being stuck in the context of transportation, how do you shift that to a new context that for the frequent traveler, we can create a answer of their travel in their lifestyle that is and low price and luxury. So how do you merge those two? How do you bring it together? And obviously you can look at the hospitality industry and we try to do that, but you can also look at other industries that do it. H&M has done an incredible job. So you can walk into an H&M for under 100 bucks, you can walk out and be dressed. But they have the most incredible Versace, Jimmy Choo, Karl Lagerfeld, Stella McCarthy, David Beckham. They all did lines for H&M that they actually rolled out. So you have the luxury and you have the price. So where do you combine those? So the biggest problem when you want to go from transportation into a new context, whatever your context is, is that we as individuals, we run after every ball. We're just like young pups. You know, you throw five balls at a young pup, they don't know where to go. That's us. So we figured that if we do not focus and you do one thing real well, then it is very difficult to get to the promised land. And when you get to the promised land, it's nice, right? Whatever success means for you. So back to Blue Ocean, John Kim and Rene Moborn said, okay, there is a methodology how to do that. And what is that methodology? First, you gotta bring costs down. Because if you do not have your construction or your operating costs under control, then you do not have the ability to share anything and be budget or be lower priced or be able to compete. So we looked at you know, building differently. So we build about 60% of our hotels modular. They got built off site, we just shipped them and we stacked the, the rooms. And in order for you to show that we really do this, this is a room that pretty much is ready to be stacked. And um, we are able to bring down the cost the speed of construction, but also because of the repetitive nature, we have learned a lot from value engineering, and I'm not only talking about price, but also functionality. The second thing is that if you want to build a brand, and that's what we want, we said, if I franchise it you know, after the first one, then I have zero control over what I'm building. And we want to look in the mirror and make all decisions and be happy with ourselves. So we're an asset heavy company. So we own and operate our hotels. Longer way in, but you get to control and say what it is. And in the end, we end up in pretty nice locations. This is our hotel uh, in London at Tower Hill that uh, looks at our neighbor, um, the Queen. The other thing that uh, uh, Blue Ocean says is that you need to create value. So if you do not create value, so you gotta bring the cost down and you need to create value because otherwise there is nothing in it for me as consumer. So luxury is a very important one. So this is a picture of our uh, living room in uh, Times Square. And uh, we chose to reduce the hotel by 14 rooms, but create a double height uh, living room. And as you walk in, we styled it, we work with, uh, you know, Julian Opie, a famous artist. We really, you know, you walk in, you go like, wow. Whereas all other hotels in New York of a mid-class or mid-price range, you walk in and basically between your luggage and where you need to check in is very difficult, right? It's very small. So there's nothing that says to you, wow. And the funny thing is, if you have such an entrance, people assume that the rooms are in the same line. So we have a very smart and efficient room, so people are very happy and they're always over service or over delivered on promise that we give, so we under promise, but it is a very good connect. So um, we do the same, this is uh, our Charles de Gaulle uh, airport uh, hotel connected to the terminals, where yeah, this could be your living room, very cool, very relaxing, and, and you know, people use it instead of sitting in a restaurant or in a bar. And when we do meeting space, uh, it is your room. The black wall is actually, uh, you know, to be written on with crayons. And we have, uh, uh, you know, grease board on the other side. Very easy uh, from a technology point of view. However you want to connect to the screen, it, it connects and we have click share there too. So it becomes your area. You have your own little environment. So again, from a consumer point of view, how can you make things easy and intuitive? And this is a budget hotel. 
looked very luxurious. So we called it that we want to create affordable luxury for the people. So five star at, at a mid-market price. So how do you take that then from transportation to leisure or how do you get that into innovation? Then on the one hand, you gotta bring the cost down and the value up, so you need value innovation. And then they describe that, okay, a new value curve is, okay, you gotta raise some, you gotta create some, but in the meantime, you also gotta reduce and eliminate some because otherwise it keeps on adding and in the end, you do not, or you're not capable of passing a benefit on from a financial point of view to the guest as well. So in the end, our proposition is really simple. We create a living room, we have a bar, an efficient room. We, our positioning is about experience. So everybody that has stayed with us, they, you know, they're cool, they're happy, it's comfortable, it's very low entry, very comfortable to people. We chose that specific niche and we said, let's digitally and technology-wise be a little smarter than the rest. Now, in the end, when we evaluate whether there is success, I, see, I think monopoly is still where we go, right? Monopoly is still where we feel that, you know, the one that has the most money wins. Well, take a look at brand value, uh, the income cost, the EBITDA, uh, you know, where, where, where do we see that that sits? If you look in the hospitality space, and these are uh, July of last year's, uh, they, I didn't have the time to update it, my apologies, but um, uh, IHG at uh, 12 billion, Accor at 11.6, uh, Hilton 28.45, and uh, Marriott uh, Starwood at 46 or almost 47 billion. Pretty impressive, right? Right. Look at Airbnb, look at Booking.com. Out of nowhere, by innovating, they came up with something different. And you say, yeah, but it's completely different. My question, is it? Because most of the large chains today have a brand or an attraction. They have more of a pass-through function than anything else. Maybe Airbnb or Booking has a different type of contracting with their owners or with their consumer, but they're not far apart anymore. And you see that through shift in thinking, in innovation, these boys are not doing so bad all of a sudden on the scoreboard, right? So it really is, and it takes a mind shift, and that mind shift, you only get there when you start to introduce context thinking. Give you an example. The whole industry talks about the loyalty programs and what it all does and this and that. And what does Airbnb do? They take 200 million, they say to a bunch of very smart kids and say, everywhere in the world where people that travel frequently want to go and know where to go and where to reach and have an effective stay, uh, food, museum, attractions, whatever it is, make it available. Oh, and while you're at it, open source. So anybody that does not travel with Airbnb should also be able to reach it. Well, that's the new world, right? That's when you become successful. Uh, Uber changed our world the same way. So it's that type of thinking that you need to unhook from traditional thinking and only about the content and the process. You need to again put it in the context because I as consumer, I get so much. When I get in my car at night, Google tells me what time I will be home. I didn't ask for it, they just provide it. That's cool stuff. So intuitive selling, intuitive way of serving up technology. We introduced uh, at Citizen M something very sophisticated. We call it ROUX. Cannot believe that you not all go like, yeah, of course. Uh, random acts of kindness. So our ambassadors and responsible for guest satisfaction, they have zero limit to make sure that if there's an opportunity to do something special for a guest, do it. Just have a little button on the cash register, ring it up so I know about it. And if you see how capable, you know, staff is, our ambassadors are to do this, it's incredible. And this is stronger, I guarantee you, than any loyalty program. Because it spreads over the internet, it spreads around way easier. 
So in a way, our philosophy is, is that uh, home is where you connect automatically to the Wi-Fi. So I see all the techies immediately go, yeah, but you need a landing page. No, you don't. We just didn't. One time we got hit uh, with some, um, some uh, problems in New York where they used our service to spread, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, interesting uh, porn. But we, we connected it, had a landing page for a little bit, released it again. But basically, there's no regulation or anything that says you have to. We're just being told that you have to. So again, if you innovate, you've got to be stubborn enough or comfortable enough to say no. So where is the future? I don't know. Uh, are we, as an industry, a home, an office? Uh, are we still a hotel? Are we a network? I don't know. Where do we need to grow beyond? Because, uh, you know, something very uh, simple that Nick mentioned, you know, what if I have, you know, one source that I can get into my Citizen N room and my Okura room and anywhere else? What if I, as the guest, stand central? Well, that would be cool for once. So what are we doing as an industry to not focus only on what it is that we do when somebody is in front of us, but what do we do to make the journey or where do we fit better into their lifestyle? And most lifestyle hotels tell you, I've curated this, I've done that, and you know, I know what my guest wants. Have we looked at, we're not that smart. We just looked at a frequent traveler What's their lifestyle? What's their need? That is not after they have rolled their luggage all through the world, a doorman that takes it for the last uh, uh, 10 feet, right? What they want is to just open the laptop and have the most ridiculous fast Wi-Fi. It's that simple. So in the end, when you look at red ocean and blue ocean, do you compete or differentiate? Do you beat your competition or you make it irrelevant? Think of Cirque du Soleil was a good example of Blue Ocean. So Cirque du Soleil was a circus without animals. Why? Because the animal activists really killed the industry. But in the meantime, it became entertainment. Wildly successful. So is there a competitive dollar or euro spent for uh, Cirque du Soleil? Obviously. But in the circus world or entertainment world, they sell twice a ticket or a price than anybody else. Why? Because of their success. Segmentation, or do we go channel and digital? Value, cost, trade-off, or do we create new business processes in order to get there? So if we have a saving in maybe front desk staff because we become smarter at using technology, that would be great, but then create a new business process. So if you introduce kiosk or a different way of uh, you know, checking into your hotel and out and having an easy entrance, then take those savings and make it available, but still greet your people. Don't do it half and have and your desk and this and that and that. It can be complementary, but the business process needs to shift. If there's not a savings to be gotten out of it and you share that, you don't get to the promised land. So people say it's young thinking that you need. I like that. And I especially like age is, not an, is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. So at my age, that starts to become pretty handy. But uh, what I wanted to sketch you for a moment, that if you want to innovate, if you want to get to using new technology, if you want to apply your brain to something, then the way to break out of it, you cannot wake up one morning and say, I can innovate. But what you can do is follow a track. What's the context? In which context do I need new things? And as you widen that circle and understand how then content and process fit in better, and you then back that up with technology, then you can drift towards new innovation and hopefully to uh, new grounds. So yeah, this is a no, you compete with everybody. So I would say uh, go for the blue ocean and roll that out. So this is a yes. Thank you, and if there's any questions, I gladly entertain some questions. Not all at once. Yes, go ahead.
From, from your experience, how difficult is in big traditional organization to introduce blue ocean compared to startup? Is the startup mentality or the culture that makes the difference? Well, um, if you look at organizations and you take a closer look, is that 90% of our organizations are top down, right? You have a pyramid and you have the ownership there, then you have your CEO and you have a gazillion levels till you get down to us that do the work. Um, there are also organizations that are empowered and they have taken that pyramid and inversed it. So the whole purpose of the people that fund things or are responsible for the overall organization is how do I support up? So when we started out Citizen M, I said, listen, I want to be a supported and empowered organization where every individual is accountable. So you get a whole different culture. Uh, you have different values that go with that. And if you're a startup and you choose for that, that could be effective. But there's also many incredible companies that are extremely top down that have a lot of success. So I think it is what is your end objective? What is the context again in which you deliver a service or, or a product? And then what fits the best for you as an organization to be there? So don't think that an empowered organization is better than a top-down organization. They're different. But not by default end up being a top-down organization. Think about that. So I think that a lot of startups focus a lot on the product that they do. And then they need help with time management and finance. And what do most people do that start to help startups? They start to tell them what they should do with the product or the issue. Shut up already, let them do what they do. But then focus on how do you help them you know, with culture, with structure, with management, with finance management. So I would say there is not a right or a wrong answer, but I think that a lot of people didn't ask the question and ended up on one side of the equation and might want to have been on the other. And that's the, the only thing. And then, of course, the type of people that you hire and ultimately how you organize your organization, yeah, that makes, it, that makes a huge difference. So companies like Booking.com that scaled, so I think that they hire like two or 2,500 people a year. If you're not an empowered organization, how are you going to do that? So it's really... Uh, you see a lot of the successful tech and more, uh, you know, successful companies today more in, you know, they work with circle management, they work with, uh, you know, accountability and responsibility rather than it coming from the top. But th the choice is yours. Thank you. All right, one more question. If not, yeah, then yeah, back one there. more. Thank you. So um, we are still a what a small company with 30 people, which makes it easy to do this kind of cultural um, community as, uh, thinking and also decision making. But how do you scale this to a company with 200, 2,000, 20,000 people to get still this kind of community thinking and still make rational and good decisions? Uh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, <laughs> I can only tell you that w w we were a startup and, and basically it was, you know, three, four of us that started the company and we built it from there. But what I think happens in those early stages is that you're such a small group that everybody interacts with each other so much that, uh, you know, whether you drink the Kool-Aid or not, I mean, you consume the Kool-Aid, right? It, it sort of comes into your flow. And then when you start to grow and you need to bring specialization or you need to do volume or you go... Uh, you know, geographically across borders or, or, or continents, then it becomes more difficult. Uh, the way we have done it is we created our values, and those are for the company. So they're not values for the guest and for our, our, our company. No, they're one and the same. And when we hire, we try to make sure that in the hiring process, and we have devised various different processes for it, that we are able to match that value of our values at least at 85% with the applicant and with the people that join us. And then it becomes much easier because you're wired the same way already and you have the same uh, respect and values and, and ways to go about. Um, 
but there's plenty of obstacles because if you grow faster, you need to bring layers in and you need to have geographic uh, impact on that. It is very difficult, but I think that the closer you stay to yourself and to your own values and are very transparent in, in sharing those and communicating those and living by them, uh, you're the best weapon for it. But to go from a uh, startup to you know, uh, a mid-sized company is a lot of heavy, heavy lifting, I can tell you that. But, but you will get there, I'm sure. I know your team. Very good. I'm still around, uh, thanks. And, uh, so a round of applause for Mr. Levy, please.